we often express about the way we feel. I feel this, I feel that. Feelings are very much part of who we are. But feelings, in some ways, are a bit like, and animals have instinct, and we have feelings. But there's a difference. And the big difference is that we have free choice. We have freedom of choice. And if we use our feelings as the only way of navigating our way through life, then sometimes that presents problems. Feelings, of course, are important. They tell us something. Um, But we have, as human beings, we have this remarkable gift of free choice. Now, when I first entered the seminary, which was uh, 47 years ago, um, I thought, didn't know quite what it meant, but I thought that when I entered the seminary, I would feel holy. I'd seen lots of what I thought were holy people, people who looked holy. Um, I had the great fortune to be taught by a remarkable group of religious sisters in Canning Town in East London. And um, and there were lots of people who looked holy, and they were holy people. And I thought to myself that when I went to the seminary, one of the things that would happen is that I would feel holy. I never felt particularly holy as a teenager, but I thought, well, when I go to the seminary, I'll feel holy. And um, so I got there my first year, and I didn't feel anything in particular. And um, got to the end of my first year, I thought, well... Didn't really feel holy during my first year. Second year came and went, third, fourth. And, uh, and I thought to myself, well, I'm never going to feel holy. I didn't know what it was, but I felt I should have felt it. Then it came to the day of my ordination to the priesthood. And um, a remarkable day. And at the day of my ordination, there was a whole load of priests. There were 60 priests. And 30 on one side of the sanctuary and 30 on the other. And during the ordination ceremony, everything was going well. And then something happened. Something that really moved me. I felt something. I, after the prostration on the floor, I got up and the bishop laid his hands on my head. I went over to my parish priest, my old parish priest, who'd been ordained in 1917. He laid his hands on my head and I could beginning to feel something very, very strong. And I went back and I knelt in front of the bishop and the bishop was there and the MC nodded to the two lines of priests to come and lay hands on me. And then I felt it in a remarkable way. I had the worst attack of cramp that I'd ever had in my life, in my left leg. And I was in agony, absolute agony. And the MC came over to me, remarkable man called Monsignor Carney, and he said, what's the matter? I said, I got cramp. He said, get up. So he stood up. He said, bow to the bishop. So he bowed to the bishop, followed me. So we went left hand around the altar, me hobbling around the altar. We get back and he said, how is it? I said, it's terrible. He says, bow to the bishop. So we bow to the bishop the second time. The bishop was looking a bit perplexed at this stage. And we went right down round, the other way round the altar. Still bad. So then he walked me the whole length of the church and back. Now, this was 1979. So people were pretty much none the wiser because they thought it was part of the renewed rite of ordination. But I felt, these terrible pain in my leg. But that's not the feeling we're talking about. And I began to realise that the sense that I was looking for was not about what I felt. Even at that most remarkable, sacred part of my life, all I felt was cramp. It wasn't so much about what I'd felt, it was what about I had chosen to do. It was about my choice. I was there because of my choice to respond to God. Feelings tell us something, but our choice 
shapes what it is that we do. Now, the two are influenced by the other, of course, but they are very distinct. And so my choices are affected by what I choose, what I desire. As we looked at yesterday, what are you looking for? What do you seek? What do you desire? And in every human being, there is a restlessness. And St. Augustine describes it beautifully. And he says the restlessness, this unease, is a sense of loss, a sense that something's not quite right. And he says these beautiful words, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Unless our hearts rest in the Lord, there is a restlessness about us. And then he goes on. Take heart, for you would not be seeking me if I had not already found you. And this is the piece he writes. I sought the Lord and afterwards I knew he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. It was not I that found, O Saviour, true. No, I was found by you. You did reach forth your hand and mine enfold. I walked and sank, not on the storm-vexed sea. It was not so much that I on you took hold, as thou, dear Lord, you took hold of me. I find, I walk, I love, but, oh, the whole of love is but my answer. Lord, to you, for you were long beforehand with my soul, because always thou loved me. So our desire is a restlessness, an inward restlessness, a longing, a place where our desire can become great desires. Because the great desire shapes our life. Other desires might shape our stomach, our desire for food, our desire for drink. It might shape the way we look. But the great desire shapes who we are. St. Catherine of Siena says, A soul raises up, rises up, restless with a tremendous desire for God's honour and the salvation of souls. So desire is not an unrealistic expectation, a strong need, or an intense feeling. A desire is something that's already touched my life. I desire something in my life that is real. So, for example, I have no desire to go to the moon. None whatsoever. I don't lie awake at night thinking... One day I'll go to the moon. But if I ever went to the moon, if I ever took that remarkable journey, if I walked on the moon and when I looked down at the earth and saw this incredible planet of ours, I know that when I came back, when I came back, on certain nights I'd look up and I would see the moon, the place where I had walked, and I'd have a desire to go back because it would be real in my life. Our faith is a school, a place, an environment for us to be schooled in great desires because it is women and men who have great desires that are the ones who shape our world for the good. And true and authentic desires are formed by our encounter with revelation, with Jesus Christ, and our belonging to the community. But our desires need to be expressed and renewed and symbolised in our lives. Thomas Merton, the great Cistercian monk, wrote this prayer about desire. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. 
I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are with me always, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. So our desire is a fact of something real in my life. And my desire for God, the desire that brings us to this retreat, the desire that brings us to prayer, the desire that brings us to the sacrament, the desire that brings us to live like Jesus and to cross the road to help our brothers and sisters in their need. Our desire to work for a better world, is part of this great desire because all of those things are real in our life. They have touched us. So our desires are forged by a commitment. You see, feelings come and go. But desires to be forged and shaped, we need to make a commitment. And the subsequent fidelity to the commitment that we have made we have to make choices we need to make our choices we need to sort out our desires and choose that which will shape us in my life in our lives and it's about making those choices the poet sylvia plath wrote this poem i saw my life well, sorry not a poem a description i saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story. From the tip of the branch, like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home, and children, and another fig was a famous poet, and another fig was a brilliant professor, and another fig was Europe and Africa and South America, And another fig was to become an Olympic lady crew champion. And beyond all these figs were many more figs I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself sitting in the branch of the fig tree, starving to death. Just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black. And one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. We all know the difficulty of making choices, especially choices that shape our life. So often those choices are based just on what we feel and nothing else. Feelings lead us. Feelings help us to understand. Feelings are a bit like a thermometer. When you put a thermometer in your mouth, you get a temperature and it gives the temperature. Now, you don't take the thermometer, which has a high temperature, to the doctors. You go to the doctors and said, this is real in me. The temperature is telling me something. Feelings tell us something. And it's important for us to understand and to listen to our feelings. Of course it is. But they are to help us to understand where we go in life. And to be able to shape where we go in life, we have to make choices. And to make choices, we then need to make a commitment 
to the choices that we've made. And then we need to be faithful to the commitment of the choices that we make. The whole thing about the vows in a marriage or as priesthood or private vows is that we are recognising the significance of this choice that I am making. The choice I am making to you, my beloved. The choice I am making to God as a priest, a religious sister, in private vows. What leads me to this is that I have experienced love in the path that I am taking. And so I'm making this choice. But for that choice then to become real, there needs to be a commitment. I must give myself. And then I need to be faithful to what I have given. You see, the problem with the rich young man, he was a good man. He'd made lots of good choices. But he wanted to hold back. He didn't want to give everything. Francis Thompson was a Victorian poet and he wrote a poem called The Hound of Heaven and it goes like this. For though I knew his love who followed, yet I was sore adread, lest having him I must have naught else beside. Yet I was afraid lest giving myself to God, giving myself in love to another, I must have naught else beside. The truth of the matter is that in making this choice, the choice for love, we have everything. All becomes mine because all is a gift of God. And so in our lives, we need fidelity to the commitments we need to make commitments to shape our desires and we need to understand our feelings because this is what starts the journey. God does not ask us to be successful but to be faithful and if we are successful it will be because we have been faithful. These words of Mother Teresa are a powerful, a powerful tool to help us to understand. We're not asked to be successful in life. We are asked to be faithful. But any success that comes in our life will be a result of our fidelity, of our saying yes and making the commitment to shape our life by the choices that we make. The crisis of so much that has underlied modern life has revealed itself as a crisis of fidelity. Its impact is felt in those areas of our lives that are most sensitive and near to us. The crisis of fidelity affects the intimate world of our personal relationships. Marriages, the priesthood, our friendships our families and our communities. One of the clearest signs that despair is waiting on the outskirts of our lives is the growing reluctance to make promises and keep them. So often we hear today that people are afraid of making a commitment. In a plastic world, promises are reduced to tentative agreements if life is disposable, so are its commitments. If treaties and promises are broken, so we can personally break our own promises. But men and women are creatures who need promises. We need to make promises because we need to trust. And trust comes about because of the words that are said to us that we believe these words. The great crisis in any age, in any person's life, is when the words that have been given to us by people we trust then turn to dust. We dream of a future sometimes without committing ourselves. That means our vision is empty and without meaning. I want to do what I 
want to do. I want to lead my life. I want to do it my way. How many times have I prepared for funerals and people say, I want Frank Sinatra singing, I did it my way. Well, it's a great song, but the sentiments are awful. To do it our way means I lack the wisdom and the understanding and the support and the fraternity that I need from others. To find that the people I trust, I can't trust, is one of the great tragedies in a human life. Promises kept are the bread of hope. They nourish our vision for the future. They challenge us to pay the price of making dreams come true. Without promises, our dreams, our hopes, they're just empty fantasies. They lack the possibility of being rooted in the earth because they are not planted in the field of life. Fidelity is the way we keep our promises. Fidelity is the enduring commitment to hope, the staying power of relationships, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, for the whole of our life. Yes, that story, that description of those vows, half of it is problematic. For better and for worse. For richer and for poorer. In sickness and in health. It's a recognition that life is not floating six foot off the ground. It's a recognition of the struggles in life. But how we deal with them is recognising that through our commitment, through our word, how much is our word worth when we make a commitment? To commit oneself is to share the future. It is to choose to live in hope. When we no longer make promises, our lives have fallen into exile and we become strangers in an alien land. In recent years, We have seen so many of our brothers and sisters become strangers in an alien land. Our society has seen so much pain, so much anxiety, because so many of our brothers and sisters have become strangers in an alien land. At the moment, there has been a pause button on the world. Now, I find it quite remarkable even to say those words, but it's true. There is a pause button. There is a moment in time when we are asked to stop, to stop living in that alien land for a while and to come together and to care for each other. And for some, that will be even more difficult because of the isolation. But it is a moment. That's why a retreat is so important. Because a retreat is not to run away. A retreat is to withdraw from the battle. It's to step back from the battle. And to see is to make a tactical withdrawal. To look back and to see where I lived in this alien land. And to find the reinforcements I need, the proper supplies, to find the comrades I need to stand alongside me. Because one day we will go back to the battle. But the moment we pause, and the opportunity for us on retreat is to be honest with ourselves. To look back and to see whether our life was just ruled by feelings of what I wanted everything was my way or whether it's possible for us to take those feelings to understand those feelings to understand what shaped those feelings yes but to be able to rebuild using those feelings the good and the bad ones so that from those feelings we can shape our desires 
the desires for the good, the desires of that which is real and life-giving in our life. And once we are clear about our desire, we then commit ourselves. And once having committed, we will be faithful. While the pause button is still at stop, let us not waste our time just watching Netflix. Let's not just waste our time repainting the front room. While the pause button is on, let us see what is truly in our hearts. Let us be faithful. Let us commit ourselves. For in finding this fidelity, we will find the success that we so long for, which is the success that comes from finding God in our life. Do not waste this time, but use it for the greatest good. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.